Well, good morning, Journey. It is uh, so good to see you. My name is Jonathan McIntosh. I used to be a pastor here for a number of years. And then about six years ago, my wife and I moved to plant a church in Memphis, Tennessee called Christ City Church. So it is an honor and a privilege to be back with you, to open God's Word with you. Uh, for those of you that know me and my family, I just want to show you a picture briefly. So that's my wife, Ashley. Our two oldest daughters, Cora and Nola, were born here when we lived in St. Louis. And then Vera, uh, and then lastly, th after three girls, uh, last time I was here to preach in May, it was a week away from Harry's birth. And so Harry was born uh, just over six months ago. So I just want to give you a little picture of, uh, of who I am. Once again, coming back here in a lot of ways feels like coming home, coming back to family. Um, and I noticed as we were driving up 55, uh, something different about St. Louis. You could just kind of feel it in the air. And it was a renewed, invigorated sense of hate um, for the Cubs, um, <laughs> which I didn't think was possible really at all, uh, that you could hate the Cubs more than you already do. Um, and then I found uh, this picture online, like, who let this happen? <laughs> Like, I've been gone for just a handful of years, and now you let this happen? Like, who? I'm blaming Russ, right? I cannot believe that you put that guy in a Cubs uniform. Anyway, um, last, a couple of years ago, I was here. They gave me one verse. We did a, like a series called One Verse, and they're like, hey, just preach on this one verse. We think you can handle that. And I preached for almost an hour through the entire Bible. So this time they said, hey, uh, let's give you three words. We think that you can do just three words. So my three words today are fear not, behold. We're in a series called Advent. And so for the next three weeks, as we get ready for Christmas, Advent is uh, anticipation. It's waiting. It's a time of awakening our heart as we look forward to the coming of Jesus. Uh, we're taking apart every week one portion of this verse in Luke 2.10. So I have this morning three words from an angel to some lonely shepherds right after the birth of Jesus. The angel pops up on the scene and he says to them, fear not, behold. This morning we're talking about fear and that's what I want to pray before we jump in because uh, I think a lot of us are very afraid. And what you and I need more than just words is we need really a visitation from God. Like we need to come in contact with God and we need him to set us free by the power of his Holy Spirit. So let me pray to that end, and then we'll jump in. Father, I, uh, I feel practically very limited. I, I'm afraid. It is a, a time of terror in our world. And so we come to the only place that we know where to run, and that's into your arms. And we pray that you would be big enough and strong enough for us. We pray practically as people that believe that there is a Holy Spirit. That there uh, is a personal God who wants to come near to us this morning and set us free. So I pray that you would do that. And maybe just stop for a minute and pray for your own heart. And your prayer simply is, free me, Lord. Free me. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you don't have to look very far in the news um, to find something to fuel your fear, right? It is, like I said earlier, an age of terror, both worldwide and here on our own soil. I mean, mass shootings, it's going haywire. Um, terror is the right word. Terrorism, I think, is the right word. And many of us are are very afraid. And sometimes we feel like, because of religion, that we just shouldn't be afraid. Like religion comes in and just says, stop it, don't be afraid. And <clears throat> that's really a false note. Like we know there's gotta be a deeper and better answer. And when you look at scripture, you see a more nuanced discussion around the word fear. <clears throat> like the Greek word that's used here for fear can be used both positively and negatively. Like the angels would say, fear not, but then later, the New Testament writers would tell you to both fear God and reverence the emperor. And both of those words are the same Greek word, phobos. Uh, we see that in this uh, theme from John Newton's hymn, Amazing Grace, that we're going to sing right after the sermon. He says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve." Like there is an appropriate fear and then there is a debilitating sense of fear. And what I'm calling the appropriate sense of fear is it's the present of fear 
meaning the gift of fear, and then we have the prison of fear. And I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but they're both PR words because I want you to remember them. There's the present of fear, and then there's the prison of fear. Like the present of fear. Let's look at this passage. The angel shows up and says, don't be afraid. But they actually had something really to be afraid of, right? We forget that. They're just, they're just hanging out in a field doing their job, blue-collar workers just doing their job, and then an 11-foot-tall burning man of fire that they've never seen before in their lives just shows up in front of them. Like, if you don't read the Bible a lot, you can think, oh, just angels were popping up everywhere. Like, who's that? Oh, that's Bob's angel. No, like... <laughs> You would be as surprised as they were if you're at your desk, at your cubicle, and then all of a sudden standing on top of your MacBook was an 11-foot tall giant burning man of fire burning your documents. Stop burning my documents, right? Like you would have to, just like they probably had to do, they had to probably change their shorts. Like they had a lot at that point in time to be afraid of. (laughs) Anyway, some of us, need the present of fear, the gift of fear. What do I mean by that? There is an awareness of the weighty things of life that many of us walk through our lives oblivious of. Meaning that if a giant vehicle is hurtling down the street and it's about to hit your child who's just run out into the road, then you need a certain appropriate amount of fear, let's say. The gift or the present of fear at that point in time would motivate you with adrenaline to run out, to say stop, right? To react appropriately to the weighty, uh, heavy things in your life. These men have just had messengers of the divine show up in their lives. And it's very appropriate for them to be, yes, a little bit afraid. It's appropriate for them to reverence the situation. The gift of fear or the the present of fear is a sense of awe. It's a sense of reverence for the weighty things in life. It's a a sense of appropriate magnitude going, you know what, this thing is big. Something's different. And here's my concern. Sometimes in my relationship with my wife, I'll look at her her fear and go, hey, don't be afraid. There's nothing for us to be afraid of. And she looks over at me and says, yes, I get that, husband, but you're just oblivious. You're just unaware. Like, Stepping out of fear doesn't mean stepping into oblivion. Many of you are just oblivious to the real weighty things in your life. Like the divine, maybe not uh, in the presence of an 11-foot tall man of fire, but every day around you, the, the divine, God himself, is breaking into your life. There are a million sacred, holy moments that you and I need to come awake to every day, and we'd rather just play Angry Birds on our phone. Right? Just too hard to just live with hearts open and connected. And so we need the gift of fear, the gift of reverence. Like, there's a moment on your daughter or your wife or your husband's face, and you can tell, like, something's here. There's an opportunity. There's a window here for me to engage, for me to draw them out, for me to offer words of encouragement, for me to take a tender moment here and connect or I can just go turn on Netflix, right? There's a moment with your coworkers, you can tell something's different about their hearts. Something's a little bit softer. They're asking questions now about life and spirituality and religion. You can just go on about your day or you can stop and go, you know what, this is a weighty moment. This is a sacred thing that I need to step into. Right? So where do you need the gift of reverence in your life? Where are you just oblivious Jumping from task to task, thing to thing, show to show, text to text. And you need to wake up to the divine stepping through into your life on a day-to-day basis, right? Where do you need the present of fear? Well, there's also, of course, a prison of fear. I think prison is the right word. Uh, You guys know the movie The Shawshank Redemption. And the last time I saw it, I noticed that the movie is an extended metaphor about fear. It's about men in prison, Shawshank prison, right? But the prison, the physical, you know, cell is not the thing that keeps them bound. 
Because over the course of the movie, a couple of these guys get released on parole. And what we find out is even when they're outside the walls of the prison, they're still imprisoned to their fear. So in the middle of the movie, one of the most tender and sad moments, this older man, Brooks, gets released on parole. But all he's ever known most of his adult life is the safety of his little jail cell, right? And he gets out and he tries to live life as a free man on the outside. And he says, I'm just tired of being afraid all the time. And his little hostel, he writes into the wood with a little knife, Brooks was here. And he hangs himself just because he can't bear living heart wide open in a world like we live in. You know that feeling, like you know the prison of fear. You know what it's like to just be tired of being afraid all the time. We see this in this text, like the shepherds needed to awake to the presence of the divine. God had stepped into planet earth. Jesus was here, but they couldn't remain shackled to their fear because they had to move on to the manger. They needed the gift of fear to wake up, but they couldn't stay, remained shackled in the prison of fear because they had to move on to the manger. And many of us can't move on to the thing that God is trying to do in our lives because we're shackled to fear. What are you afraid of? Where's the prison of fear operative in your life? There's so much, right? Everybody in here knows what it's like to be afraid of others. The Bible calls it the fear of man. We may not process it like fear, but it means uh, the opinions, the thoughts of other people, the words of other people mean more to us than the thoughts and words of God. Like we're very concerned about how we are being perceived by other people. We fear the future. We fear the unknown. We fear our own safety. We fear if you're a parent The minute you have a kid, it's now to live with new fear that you weren't even aware of. Like, I am a reckless human being. I will do a lot. But if my kids are there, like, wait a second, don't touch them, right? We're we're afraid for our children's personal safety. If you're a Christian, you're afraid about your children's salvation. There's so much for us to be afraid of. At an existential level, at a deep emotional and psychological level, we're afraid of opening up and being known. We're afraid of vulnerability. Every man in here, whether they would admit it or not, you may offer a confident face to the world, but inside there's this voice that says you're a fraud. And one day you're going to be found out for who you are. You're not the man everyone thinks you are. You're not the husband or dad everyone thinks you are. You're a fraud. We're we're afraid of being known, of being exposed. We're we're afraid of missing out. Like we have whole like terms for this called FOMO. Small things like, hey, who's doing something cool over there? But like big things, like I'm afraid of like missing out. My, like, will my life matter? Will my life count? Or will I miss out on it all? We're afraid, especially those of you that have experienced heartbreak. You're afraid of trusting again. You trusted once and you were only stabbed in the back by a close friend. You gave your heart to someone and it was crushed. You're afraid of loving again, of risking again, of trying out for the team again, of getting involved in your life again. And fear has you bound up. It has you shackled. Anybody, can I get maybe a nod of the head or an amen? Like, yes, I'm, I'm tracking with you, I'm there. What's the answer? Well, this text tells us, fear not, behold, right? The answer is beholding. And it's a simple word, but it's not a simple solution because it's a hard task. What does behold mean? Behold means to look in faith. Now, what does that mean? Because we use faith uh, so many different ways. So we would use faith sometimes as just a synonym for religion. Like he's of the Christian faith. He's of the Jewish faith. It just means religion. Or we would use faith to mean morality. Like he's a man or she's a woman of faith. What does that mean? They're just a moral person. We use faith to mean like simple kind of like blind faith or belief. Just believe in something, right? We use faith that way. But that's not what I mean by faith. Beholding or looking in faith is this. It's considering something until your heart has, your heart has a sense of its value. To behold, to look in faith means that you consider something, you think about something, you meditate on something until your heart has a sense of its weight, worth, and value. 
right? Those of you that are living in the shackles or the prison of fear, you're rehearsing the same scenarios in your mind all the time. What if she says this? What if this happens to them? What if I come out and I open up my heart to other people and I'm just rejected, right? You're rehearsing these scenarios in your head. What are you doing? You're beholding. You're thinking about something. You're considering something until your heart has a sense of its weight, worth, and value. And the answer for us as followers of Jesus that will free us from our shackles of fears that we've got to behold something else. We have to consider something else until our hearts have a sense of its weight, worth, and value. What is that something else? Well, first of all, it's God. We have to become and behold God. And this is an imaginative work. Like, I'm not going to tell you anything right now in the next few minutes that you haven't heard before if you're a follower of Jesus. Like, I'm not going to give you brand new information where you go, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to take that note down, right? I'm hoping that you come away with a new sense of the weight, worth, and value of God not just cognitively, but emotively, existentially, so much so that the quote-unquote fear or reverence of the Lord will push out the fear of everything else in your life. Like, what is the weightiest thing in your life? And I'm not trying here to make a case for the existence of God. Obviously, as a, a Christian, I'm a theist. I believe that God exists, but my concern is that Most of us, Christian or not, would say, yeah, there's something out there. There's a divine out there. But we live practically like atheists every day, completely oblivious and unaware that there is a God. There is a divine being, and he wants to be known by you. Like the the biggest elephant in the room, the biggest rock in the world, the sun at the center of your solar system should be God himself. Like, do you know him? Have you ever come in contact with the holy, the divine, the God who is? Have you ever just come smack up against God? And you get these moments sometimes when you're listening to maybe your favorite song or maybe when you've come into church and you, you feel something unnerving, unsettling. And you're a little afraid, right? You're a little afraid. Like, you feel it. Like, God is here. He's real. And he's drawing you. Like, he's calling many of you to himself. And you're like, that's the problem. Like, I just don't, I'm a, uh, uh, uh. like many of you just come service after service, you come face to face again with something that you can't explain, that you can't define, and you're so afraid to take the next step. That's God himself. And I would say he's wooing you. He's beckoning you. Will you give in to him? And it's so hard because it means, in a sense, the word I use is consumed. He will consume you in a good way. He will chase you, and he's chasing many of you down. Like uh, Charles Spurgeon would call God the hound of heaven. To call God a jealous God doesn't mean that he's insecure. It means that he desires you to himself, for himself. Give in. Do you have a, a sense of the weight, worth, a holy sense of awe of God himself? That's what you need to both free you from being completely oblivious about life, that there's the sacred and it's pressing into your everyday life and to free you from the shackles of all those other little fears that held you bound, that hold you bound. What else do you need to behold? Well, at Advent we say that, that God is Jesus coming into our, our world, right? That's Christmas. We celebrate what we call the incarnation. The incarnation means God enfleshed. That's what we're waiting for. That's what we're looking forward to is that God, in a moment in time, in the middle of our comings and goings, in the middle of us, our life, God didn't stay removed and out there, but God came downstairs. He didn't stay up ensconced in his heaven. He came downstairs to us, and he lived among us as one of us, that God clothed himself in skin and bone and lived an actual real life as a human being. And he suffered real things and he was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. And he had real emotions. And because of Jesus now, we have a God who knows what it's like to be afraid. Do you realize that? Like, let me show you this verse, Mark 14, 33. 
Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the night that he's being handed over to suffering and death. It's the night he's going to be betrayed by a close friend. It's the night that all his buddies are going to leave. It's the night he's going to go to the cross. He goes to the garden to pray. He takes Peter, James, and John with him. And it says in Mark 14, 33, that he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And the Greek there for greatly distressed means to be given over to terror. Jesus, the God-man, came face to face with the cross and he was in terror. Now, why does this comfort you? Those of you that have kids, you know what it's like for your kids to experience fear. Fear after a scary movie, fear of the dark, fear of going to school on the first day. You know, as they get older, their fears get more complex. But to have kids is to pastor them through their fear. And hopefully no parent in here, when their kid comes like, I'm afraid, just like, stop it. <laughs> now go play, right? Just don't be afraid, right? That's, the, that's religion's answer. Like, you're like, I'm scared. That's a sin. Repent, right? That's not helpful at all. Thank you. What do you do when your little kid's afraid? You come down, you know what, honey? I know what it's like to be scared too. Like one time I was in sixth grade and I got made fun of for the socks I wore too. And I you know, know what it's like to be afraid. I know what it's like to be scared, to be afraid of a new, a new school. I know what it's like to be afraid. And you come and you cuddle your kid and you go, daddy knows what it's like to be afraid too. And what does that do? Your kid goes, big people can be afraid. Yes, big people can be afraid. What God is saying to us in Jesus Christ is big people can be afraid too. Does that not give you a lot of comfort? Like no other major world religion gives you this. A God who knows intimately, personally, personally what it's like to be afraid. Jesus came to the cross, the very task of his life, and he was afraid. We have a God in Jesus who knows what it's like to be afraid. He's not just the almighty. He's not just the powerful. He's not just the huge burning one. He's also one who stepped into our reality and knows what it's like to be afraid. And that gives me so much comfort. That is my Jesus. That's the Jesus we worship. That's the Jesus we celebrate in Christmas. Do you know that Jesus? Do you know the God who's come near and says, honey, I know what it's like to be afraid. And you get to say, big people know what it's like to be afraid too. That should bring you great comfort in the middle of your fear. You have one who knows he's been there. How else does beholding or looking to Jesus in faith help you with your fear? Well, I think one thing that haunts us, and we identify it in different ways, and it comes to us and we perceive it and we experience it in different ways, but I think one thing that haunts us all is the thing that's waiting for us all at the end of our lives. Like we're living our lives, we're singing our songs, we've got our plans, and we've got our plan. you know, all, just life is in front of us. And what am I going to do today? And what am I going to do in five years? And we've got all these, this great you know, scheme, dreams, hopes. But at the end of it, you know that one thing's going to thwart it all, and that's your own personal death. Like you and everyone you know is going to die. Like, wow, thanks for that Christmas pick-me-up, Pastor. <laughs> like, you can't escape that. And those of you that have lost someone close to you know the pain of it on this side. But personally, we all know, like, there is a black curtain in front of us that everyone has to go through. And despite all of our Bible verses and all of our faith, like, no one knows 100% certain what's on the other side of that. And it may not just, I don't think it's the pain necessarily of death, even though I don't want to die in some kind of, like, gruesome accident. I think it's just, like, the unknown. Like, what's behind that curtain? Because it's waiting for us all. Fear of death haunts us. And you cognitively might not say, I'm afraid of death. But I think I see it in our culture all the time, and it comes out as our deep hatred for getting older. Like, no one's like, hey, I'm another year older. (laughs) Ah, great. Right? Everyone, like, we just have a culture that hates old age. Like, don't ask me how old I am. What are you saying? I'm looking older? You know, like, if we had a biblical understanding of age, we would approach it like, I'm one year wiser and I'm one year closer to seeing Jesus. Like we don't think about age that way. Everyone's afraid of gray hair. Everyone's afraid of, you know, my daughter pulled me down one day and she was like looking at my head and she's like, Daddy, you're getting gray like Paul Paul and you're going to go up to heaven to see Jesus. (laughs) 
Okay. I mean, sequentially, yes, but, you know, <laughs> false cause, ad hominem, you know, it's, uh, it's afr- like afraid of old age. I think that's because we're afraid of death. Like we're afraid of our lives ending as we know it. And what's interesting is the Bible says that there's an enemy and he wants to keep you enslaved to the fear of death. And this is one thing that Jesus came to free you from. So Hebrews chapter 2, you can look at it in your Bible, but we're going to put it on the screen as well. Hebrews chapter 2 says this about Jesus. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. What does that mean? Well, we're flesh and blood. We're humanity. This is an Advent text that Jesus, this is an incarnation text. Jesus partook of the same things, flesh and blood like us, that through death, what might happen? He might destroy. He might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. That there is an enemy to your soul, the devil. There's a dark spiritual force out there, and he wants to keep you in bondage, enslaved to what? To the fear of death. To the fear of the unknown out there, to the fear of your life ending. And one thing that Jesus came to do, personally and practically, is to free you from being in bondage to the fear of death. How did Jesus do that? It says in Hebrews 2 that he did it through his death. That through death, he might release those who through lifelong slavery to fear of death. Like, Jesus came and he fell on that sword himself. That is the God that we serve. We have an elder brother in Christ who has gone through the black curtain in front of us and then he came back from the dead. To believe in Jesus is to believe in the resurrection. He came back from the black curtain and he said, you know what? I now have visited the other side. I've taken its worst into myself and now you have nothing to fear. I would love for you this morning to be spiritually freed and released now from the fear of death because Jesus has gone before you and now tells you practically you have nothing to be afraid of. Jesus fell on that sword so that we can be free. Do you know practically freedom from the fear of death? And maybe it's not death. Maybe it's not death. I think it's just something even a layer deeper. As you pull back the layers of our fear. Because The Bible teaches us, and maybe you don't believe this story, but there's something in you that resonates with it. The Bible teaches us that everyone after their death will have to give an accounting of some sorts. And that actually gives us great hope as we look at injustice around the world because we know that perpetrators of injustice will have to give an accounting. They may never be on this earth in this life They will never maybe be brought to terms to justice because they've evaded justice all their lives. But we can trust that one day God, as he makes everything right and as he heals the world, that he will make the perpetrators of injustice answer for their crimes. Everyone, in a sense, will have to answer before the God of the universe. The Bible tells us this is judgment. That one day, when you pass through the black curtain that you will stand before the Holy One Himself completely, in a sense, naked, completely exposed. And I think we fear this. I think we're afraid that the watching eyes of the universe will peer, and even now peering into our souls, behind all the layers of self-deception, behind the good face, behind the, yeah, I'm all right, behind our best foot forward, The watching eyes of the God of the universe can peer into our soul, and one day we will be laid bare before him. We will be finally exposed. And I think our greatest fear is judgment. And you may not receive it or experience it as, I'm afraid of judgment. But here's the fear. It's the fear of finally one day being fully known, fully exposed, everything in you, every drive, desire, motivating factor, every action in your life being finally exposed, being fully seen to the bottom and then being rejected. Being seen fully and going, 
the watching eyes of the universe saying, I now reject you. Depart from me. That's what Scripture says from the words of Jesus. Hell is. Depart from me. I never knew you. I think we, we may not live consciously afraid of that, but I think that underlines all of our fears. And maybe you're looking over the fence at Christianity, and you're like, I get away from fear of judgment by not believing in your God. Right? I know how to deal with that. I just don't believe in you know, this complicated mythology you call Christianity. So you may not be you know, consciously afraid of judgment. You might not say, you know, I don't need a God out there to forgive me for anything. Like I live my own life. I'm the master of my own destiny. And there's no God on the other side who's going to you know, weigh the scales or judge me for anything. Okay, I hear that. But I still think underneath that, there is a fear of what I call the verdict. Now, several years ago, I'm not, definitely not going to get any cool points for this. Uh, I would listen to an artist called John Mayer. John Mayer. And uh, John Mayer has a song. I mean, you're like, who's John Mayer? Yeah, whatever. Don't act. You know, you've, you've listened to the song. There's a song on his first album called Why Georgia. And he's a young man in his early 20s. And uh, he's like looking around at his life. He's like, how did I end up here? You know, like, how did I end up in Georgia? Why am I here? Many of you are like, you know, you're like that about your life. Like, why St. Louis? Or why am I here? And then he says this, I wonder sometimes about the outcome of a still verdictless life. And then the refrain that plays through the song, the entire song, the entire song is, am I living it right? Am I living it right? I wonder sometimes about the outcome of a still verdictless life. Am I living it right? And I think actually that question plays over each of our hearts. There's a question mark over your heart. And maybe you've, you know, abandoned the conservative religion of your past. You've abandoned or left you know, the God of the Bible, and you're like, you know what? I'm the master of my own destiny. I don't need you to tell me what's right or what's wrong. I don't need you to weigh or evaluate my life. And yet underneath that, as you're living your life, there's still a sense of dis-ease. There's still a sense of unease. There's still a question mark over your entire life. Like, I'm wondering about the outcome of a still verdictless life. Am I living it right? Because I don't know anymore. And this is one of the major gifts that Christianity can give you today is that you can know for certain. That you can walk away knowing the verdict in advance. You don't have to wonder anymore. This is the fear that under, this is what we were talking about earlier. Like it's, a, it's fear of being known. It's fear of being exposed. Am I living it right? Because I don't even believe in the standards of God anymore. And I I'm tired of crafting and creating my own morality. I don't even know. I'm just confused about even where I should go or what I should do. And I'm, I don't even know where to turn or who to ask for help. And you can have some clarity and certainty today. Well, first of all, like, no, you're not living it right. You're an idiot. Like, you don't love people well. And you are very selfish, and you live oblivious to little sacred moments in your life where you could care for other people, and you're bound up in fear, and when you should take a risk and be bold, you don't, and when you should use wisdom and thoughtfulness, you're brash and insensitive. No, you're not. But that's the point. In Jesus, we have one who did. He did live it right. And he wants to give you the gift of his right living. And you can know with clarity and with certainty the verdict now. You don't have to go, I'm still wondering about the outcome of a still verdictless life. You can know the verdict in advance. Because the word over Jesus' life was, well done, my good and faithful servant. And you can know today the well done of the Father. If you could sense him drawing you near, whispering into your ear, saying, there's so much out there to be afraid of, and yet I've got you. You're going to be okay. Well done. If you could know that, 
if you could know the deep approval of God himself, what courage would that give you, right? Nothing would stick to you. But how can we, it just seems like logically doesn't make sense. How can we know the verdict in advance? Well, we have to go back to Mark 14, 33. Remember Jesus in the garden. He, he took with him Peter, James, and John. He began to be greatly distressed and troubled. Remember, greatly distressed, given over to, over to terror. Why was Jesus in terror? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Now, he's going to the cross, and he knows what awaits him there. And certainly, there's physical pain at the cross that he'd never experienced that you and I have not experienced. He would be betrayed by, by a close friend. All of his buddies would run in fear as cowards. They would take a whip embedded with stones and pieces of glass and whip him till it opened up his back. They would hang him naked in front of other people as they mock him. So it's emotionally, psychologically very damaging. And he would die a death of suffocation or asphyxiation, a very painful, slow way to die. But I don't think that's the terror. Because other followers of Jesus, martyrs later, would face that kind of death and even worse, and they would do it, it seems, with greater courage than even Jesus did. Why is that? Like followers of Jesus have gone to more gruesome deaths with their heads held high. Here's the hard reality that we've got to get close to. I'm trying to move you to a painful point. We see in Mark 13, I mean uh, 1433. Jesus is given over to a type of terror that if you're a follower of him, you, you will never have to experience. Jesus' terror is not just of the physical pains of death. Jesus' terror is of swallowing into himself the justice of God at all sin. Jesus stood exposed before the watching eyes of God on your behalf, and he experienced ultimate rejection, judgment, wrath, or words that we've used before to describe this. That's what Jesus somehow experienced on the cross, that he drank it into himself, that the judgment and justice of God at sin was poured out fully on Jesus. Jesus experienced something at the cross that made him quake in his boots as he looked to it. And if you're a follower of his, if you're in Christ, Jesus experienced a terror that you will never have to face. He experienced the ultimate terror of judgment so that you and I can have the well-done verdict of God, so that we can live free, so that we can live with great courage, so that we can embrace the thing that we're most afraid of. Jesus experienced that to free you from something that you'll never have to face. Praise him. That is the cross of Jesus Christ. Come to him today. Do you know him? Have you experienced this freedom? Go back to the Shawshank Redemption. So at the end of the movie, the character played by Morgan Freeman, Red, is released on parole. And he has a choice to make, just like Brooks did. He goes, I understand. I understand the choice Brooks made. He, he's there in the same room that Brooks was in. And he looks up and says, Brooks was here. And he feels uneasy in the free world. And yet, he's made a promise to his friend, Andy Dufresne, Tim Robbins here in this picture, to come look for him in Zewatineo, remember? And then he says these words at the end of the movie, terrible thing to live in fear. A terrible, wasted life to live shackled down in the prison of fear. And then he says this, better get busy living or get busy dying. And many of you are dying. And it's time to get busy living. Why? Because you have a God 
who came near in Jesus, a God who's been afraid. You have a God who's gone before you in Jesus through the black curtain so that even death itself can become a new blessing. You have a God who took judgment in on himself so that you can know the great verdict even today, the well done today. And if you knew this, if you could behold this, remember behold this, considering something until your heart has a sense of its weight, worth, and value, if you could behold this, would, this would change you. You would live with so much freedom in your life. Nothing would hold you back. Courage is not not being afraid. Courage is not not being afraid. Everyone's afraid. Everyone's scared. I'm scared. We live life scared. It's what are you going to do with that fear? Courage is knowing that you are beloved son or daughter with the finished verdict of Jesus himself facing that fear head on. Today's the day to stand up. Today is the day. Today is the day to take that risk. Today is the day to love again. Today is the day to open up. There's a secret sin that you've been so afraid to tell somebody about. Today is the day to open up in vulnerability. Today is the day to ask for help. Today is the day to love again. Today is the day there's some friend or family member who through their destructive actions are destroying relationships. And if someone would just be bold enough to say, it's gotta stop. There's a friend or coworker that you know needs to hear about Jesus, but you've just been so afraid of this awkward conversation. Today is the day to make the phone call. Today is the day to quit the job that's been holding you back in order for you to you know, open up to this new thing that's on your heart that you've prepared for, but you're so afraid to embrace. Today is the day to trust God again with your life. Today is the day to get up out of the muddy field and follow the angel to the manger. To behold Jesus. Amen. Yeah, let's let's pray. God. It's a terrible thing, terrible thing to live in fear. So free us. Free us from fear of the unknown, fear of man, fear of death, fear of judgment, fear of the final verdict. And let us taste in a very practical way the freedom that the love of God brings. Free us. Maybe your prayer as we go into confession to communion is, God, show me this one place, one place where I'm living in fear. I need to wake up and see you and be released. Show me one place. Free us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.